This is a map of the London Tube and Rail. If you've never seen it before, it may seem like a bunch of confusing lines crammed together, but in reality, it displays just about all of London's public transportation systems. Each color identifies a different line of transport, and obviously, there's tons of them. But the ones we are going to be focusing on are all these solid colored lines you see here, which represent the London Underground lines. These orange lines here, which are used to identify the London Overground trains lines, these lime green lines that represent the trams, the blue lines here, which represent the Docklands Line Light Railway Tracks, or DLR for short, and finally all of these different coloured lines here, which represent the National Rail. These all basically make up the core of how London functions. I know it's a lot, but London is a global city home to almost 10 million people. And when you also consider the tourists from around the world and visitors from other parts of the UK, the numbers are even higher. So it's very needed. Yet, despite this, the Transport for London, or TFL for short, which basically owns most of London's public transportation systems, is still ranked very highly worldwide in terms of efficiency. But to understand how they all work in unison, I think the easiest way is by splitting everything up a bit, between the north and south of the River Thames. The reason for this is because both sides were not created equally, which we'll get into in a bit. North of the Thames is heavily serviced by the London Underground, also famously known as the Tube. First opened in 1863, the London Underground was the world's first underground transportation system and serves as a shining beacon to London's envious and ambitious infrastructure design. The Underground is a rapid transit system serving 5 million people every single day, making it one of the world's busiest metro systems. It splits into 11 different lines, serving primarily the Greater London area with some parts of Buckinghamshire, Essex and Hertfordshire as well. For the most part, the Tube is extremely efficient and quick as well. Take for example the Victoria Line. Even during peak periods, the train runs every 100 seconds. That's basically another train lined up before you've even left the platform. All these lines feed into 272 different stations throughout London. And surprisingly, the longest distance between two stations is just 6.3 kilometers. That is between Chalfant and Latimer and Chesham on the Metropolitan Line. It's designed so that no matter where you are, you'll be able to catch the tube. I mean, that's the whole point of public transportation, right? Overall, the entire tube network spans 250 miles, making it the seventh largest metro system in the world. But obviously, that's not enough for London. And that's where the many options come in. Just like there's the London Underground, there's also the London Overground, a suburban rail network that provides routes that are more of a ring around central London rather than through it, bypassing the craziness of the core. It's the perfect complement to the Underground and has the next largest annual ridership with 189 million people annually, with 113 stations on nine different lines. The Docklands Light Railway serves as yet another option for transport, mostly north of the River Thames as well. It's a somewhat niche system, serving primarily East London and more specifically the Docklands area, but there's still more than 100 million people that ride on this automated light rail system annually, and that's because it provides a direct connection between London's two major financial districts, Canary Wharf and the City of London. This makes it the busiest light rail system in the entire UK. Now, before I get into London's public transportation that's south of the River Thames, I actually want to talk about buses, because, well, they are used heavily on both sides of the river and are actually the most used mode of transportation overall in London. Their bus system is one of the most extensive in the entire world. The city has a fleet of over 9,000 iconic red buses and the second largest zero emission bus fleet in Europe, only behind Moscow. About 6 million passengers make their journeys on one of the 7,000 bus rides happening every day, being delivered to over 700 different routes. That adds up to a ridership of over 2 billion people annually. Just to put that into perspective, if you combine the annual ridership of New York City, Los Angeles and Paris's bus network, you'd get roughly the same amount of passengers as London's. It's a relatively cheap system too. Take for instance the bus fare. A full day of bus only travel costs a maximum of five and a half dollars. Or even if you need it for just an hour, you can pay less than two dollars for something called the hopper fare, letting you travel on unlimited buses or trams for free within one hour of touching in for your first journey. And thanks to things like the London congestion charge, which charges all private vehicles being driven in this zone here in central London, $17 per day of use, it's that much better a service. In the first year of its implementation alone, the zone had a 30% reduction in traffic congestion and a 30% increase in average speeds, while bus passenger numbers rose 38%. It's something that, while amazing, not many countries use it. New York City, for example, which in my opinion is very comparable to London in many ways, doesn't have one. At least, not yet. Anyways, like I said earlier, south of the River Thames and South London overall is a completely different world to what works up north. 
Take for instance the London Underground. I mean, yeah, it technically does go south of the Thames with lines like the Victoria and Jubilee, but it barely has a presence there. Of the 272 stations connected to the Underground, only 31 of them are in South London. This is the case for most transportation systems up north. They just don't have a real presence in this area. But of course, there's reasons for that. The first being geology. North of the River Thames has perfect soil for tunneling, whereas the south of it had waterlogged clay, which made it not very coherent and way more difficult to tunnel through. Then there's the matter of South London being less populated and therefore cheaper to build through above ground. Look at this map of London from 1794. You'll see the city grew mostly north and west of the Thames. So the tube was built where most people were and where it was needed most. That's where the most opportunity was, after all. Besides, by the time the London Underground began being built, the South already had an extensive suburban rail system after being carved up by many private railway companies. So it wasn't needed as much as well. As a result, millions of Londoners living south of the Thames rely on suburban rails much more than anything else. And that's where the National Rail comes in. Simply put, the National Rail is a cooperative, unincorporated association of a network of train operating companies, and together they form Great Britain's intercity train network, which you can see here. Since the underground is barely a thing south of the river, the National Rail forms the bulk of public transport throughout the neighborhoods there. There's also the London trams. Although the light rail trams primarily serve Croydon and its surrounding areas, they still have almost 30 million annual riders. Now, the final piece to this transportation puzzle is the Elizabeth Line. Although still extremely new and not yet fully operational, it's a commuter and intercity line that connects the Great Western Main Line and Great Eastern Main Line via some central London stations. Its importance cannot be understated. Many journey lines will be slashed with this line, such as going from Woolwich to Whitechapel will now be down to 9 minutes from around 25 to 30 minutes, and Farringdon to Canary Wharf will now just take 10 minutes, more than 50% quicker than the previous journey time. Broadly speaking, the Elizabeth line will make journeys a lot quicker and take a lot of pressure off the central line, one of the tube's busiest lines. Altogether, journeys made by public transportation systems account for 37% of all of London's journeys, making it the most widely used method of getting somewhere in the city. It's also important to realize that all of these transportation systems which I've talked about are all connected. The TFL is responsible for the tube, overground, DLR, buses, and trams, just to name a few. Or in image form, these routes are what TFL controls. Because of this, they all complement each other insanely well. Like, for example, the Tube and DLR have a number of interchanges between their systems, and together they make up 40% of the journeys between inner and outer London. Everything is also integrated via TFL's Oyster Card, a credit card-sized electronic ticket which offers almost unlimited use on almost all of London's public transportation systems for a relatively cheap price, depending on the times you use it. Although this form of payment has slowly been declining due to the rise of contactless credit cards, it's still used over 12 million times each year. Now, as great as London's public transportation is, it's not your only option. And no, I'm not talking about private cars, which is, to be fair, another option, but rather walking. Walking makes up 24% of all London journeys, and it's actually an amazing city for this. London is ranked the fifth most walkable city in the world, and I believe it's due to London being one of the oldest major cities in the world. So of course, it wasn't made for cars. What I mean is, contrary to the title of this video, London wasn't really designed. I mean, it was, kinda, and especially after World War II due to the Germans bombing the city, but London really just grew naturally over almost 2000 years. So all in all, London is an easy city for getting around. And while there can be problems with delays or TFL's lack of funding, which to be honest would take a whole nother video to explain, it's done amazing with what it's got. Thank you for watching.